Welcome to the Saddleback College Emeritus Institute, Dorothy Marie Lowry Distinguished Guest Lecture Series, recorded in spring 2020. Thanks also to our faculty moderator, Mrs. Laura Hoffman. For more information regarding the Emeritus Institute, please visit our website at www.saddleback.edu forward slash emeritus. pleasure and honor it has been to put this semester's lecture together, lecture series together, especially to meet and moderate our 14 uniquely different and captivating guest lectures for the Dorothy Marie Lowry Distinguished Guest Lecture Series. And it has been a pleasure meeting you, my modern world culture class, and working as a part of a great team here at the Emeritus Institute. I also want to thank Dan Predale, our Assistant Dean of Extended Learning, and the Director of the Emeritus Institute for your excellent leadership and support. And, and I want to thank Dr. Gregory Jenks for joining us today, and he also introduced our semester together. You know him well. And this talk is going to wrap up our semester. So I am very pleased to announce our very own Emeritus Professor. And of course, you'll recognize him as our faculty moderator of last year's Dorothy Laurie Distinguished Guest Lecture Series. Dr. Gregory Jenks is joining us. And he's speaking on a timely topic, COVID-19, climate change, and some thoughts about the end of the world. Here's a bio on Dr. Jenks. He once served as instructor for the Dorothy Marie Lorry guest lectureship, and now teaches Bible as literature, introduction to philosophy, and history of free thought in the Western world for the Emeritus Institute, and is a writing specialist at Soka University. He holds a THM and a PhD in New Testament studies from Dallas Theological Seminary with a focus in Pauline Christology and in several subdisciplines of New Testament studies, including Greek grammar, textual criticism, hermeneutics, New Testament backgrounds, and biblical theology. He has published Paul and his moral mortality, imitating Christ in the face of death, where he presents first century views of mortality and premature death. He also published several uh, research articles on the origins of Paul's theology, including Paul's unique appropriations of the Hebrew scriptures in his writings. Greg has traveled all over the Northern Hemisphere for fun and research and has photographed New Testament manuscripts in Turkey and Albania. He smuggled Bibles into the Eastern Bloc and served on survey expeditions to China and Central America. He lived in Germany for a year and in Italy for eight years and is now married to his Italian wife, Angela. He was born, he's local. He was born in Tustin and loves Southern California where he enjoys open water swimming in the waters of Crescent Bay and North Laguna Beach and hiking Morro Canyon. He loves people, coffee, and light conversation about heavy philosophical topics. And this is gonna be quite a topic. May <laughs> I present Dr. Gregory Jinks. Thank you very much, Laura. That was a good, great introduction. I wrote it, it was a little bit long, I think there. And <laughs> so, yeah, I've got a lot of credentials and stuff. I've been around a little bit with the new world of the Bible, which a lot of you are familiar with. Some of you may know nothing about it, but it's something that really is a big focus of my life. And uh, I just wanna let you know that I am very happy to be back here again. And, uh, and I know many of you, I just am so sad that I can't be with you right now. I love the interaction from the stage and being able to see you all and talk. And uh, I hope you all are doing well. I hope you are uh, surviving um, the isolation and uh, from my classes, we have a Zoom happy hour. Where we get together and talk together about 
the struggles of being alone. But I know a lot of you are getting out and taking the walks to the golf course or whatever, and that's that's nice. And uh, I miss the open water, you know. And maybe maybe soon, maybe soon we'll get back to to go swim. But um, it's just really good to be back here. And I just want to thank Dan and and Laura for inviting me and allowing me to to take take part in this in this uh, semesters. Um, and uh, we have a real interesting topic today. I'm going to go ahead and and start my um, a PowerPoint presentation. And I thought I'd start our conversation about something heavy and dark. It's not going to be that heavy or dark, I hope, but with a nice, beautiful picture. This is something I just, I could stare at this hummingbird all day long. And that's kind of what I've been doing here in this, as we're in quarantine. What are we going to do? We study up pictures on the internet and all, and this is a beautiful picture. But what we're going to be talking about today is something that is a little dark. And so I thought, man, let's just talk, let's just look at something that's really beautiful and alive. And as we talk about COVID-19 and climate change, and then about the end of the world, what is going on? Who let this guy in the door to talk about all this stuff? Why do we have to talk about something so heavy? And I get it. Well, I hope this conversation is not as heavy as you might have anticipated when you look at the title. Um, let me... Let me, let me just start by addressing the, the obvious question. Why, you know, why do we have to be so morbid? You know, why do we have to talk so much about, um, uh, about the end of the world? You know, why do we talk about do so negative things like the coronavirus and climate change and the end of the world and death? Uh, having enough bad news, and if you're like me, you know, I am tired of news. I'm tired of CNN. I'm tired of Apple News. I'm tired of it all. All I hear is this constant onslaught of people telling me how we're all going to die. And man, and you better stay inside. And, and then other people saying, I'm not staying inside. I'd rather die than stay inside. And and then, well, you know, then before this, the talk about climate change. And for a long time, I just didn't like the whole climate change conversation. I just thought, oh, let, it's all politics. It's all, and I get so tired of that. And I think you do too. Some of you know, some of you go, no, I love this. I love talking about how wrong the world is and how we can change it. Okay, we can talk about that too. That's gonna be part of our conversation today. But, um, you know, it's like, as we talk about this, we're, we're thinking about how frail we are, how vulnerable we all are as a planet, how we are vulnerable we are as people. So we talk about, so what's in the back of all of our minds, the, the pink elephant in the room, is that this world is very fragile. And we are somehow responsible for a lot of what's going on around here. We don't know how, we don't know how to fix them necessarily, but that's the conversation, that's the alarm. And so, you know, and then there's the last final thing we never talk about, and that's the topic of death. We talked about it because we're an older adult community, and we have to talk about some of those things. It's wise to talk about it. You better make a will and prepare for that stuff. But who wants to go around thinking about death all the time? And, you know, having just had enough bad news. Well, I, um, I got in this conversation in fact, I prepared most of this talk, about 80% of this talk in January. I was ready in case, um, if you remember last year, I was the moderator of the, the guest series, the guest lectureship series, and I had to step in at the last second and speak. And I did my best at that time, but I thought, you know what, I need to be ready to, to speak on something in case I'm ever asked to. So I prepared a lot, a big message around climate change and about the end of the world as well. A lot of what we're going to talk about today. And I saw quotations like this one. This is Pope Francis in, in September 2019, just six, eight months ago. He said, we have caused a climate emergency that gravely threatens nature and life itself, including our own. Um, and then the Times Person of the Year for last year, Greta Thunberg from Sweden, you know, this young girl who says that planet Earth is at risk of a total ecological collapse that could be the end of humanity as we know it. And I'm hearing these quotations and I'm getting weighed down because I'm realizing, oh my gosh, climate change. Now we've got the coronavirus, right? And we're 
we haven't, we're not talking about climate change anymore. We're talking about, man, get those masks on, wash your hands, and let's get some social distancing built into our system. But, it, you know, so that was added on after this whole thing. And now all I'm hearing is negative news about how we, it's no longer about just about politics. It's about how, man, our world is crumbling. And so I, I, I go back and look at some Earth Day predictions. I went online and found these things. Civilization, just a second. Civilization will end within 15 or 30 years unless immediate action is taken against problems facing mankind. That's Harvard biologist George Wall. Um, we are in an environmental crisis which threatens the survival of this nation and of the world as a suitable place of human habitation. That's the Washington University biologist, very commoner. Man must stop pollution and conserve his resources, not merely to enhance existence, but to save the race from intolerable deterioration and possible extinction. That's in a New York Times editorial. The population will inevitably and completely outstrip whatever small increases in food supplies we make. The death rate will increase until at least 100 to 200 million people per year will be starving to death during the next 10 years. That's Stanford University biologist Paula Ehrlich. These are all predictions of imminent demise of our society, of civilization, of our world. It's all Earth Day predictions, but what's surprising about this is they all came out in April of 1970. So, the feelings that we're all having today are not new. There have been people who have spent in this whole, in our, in our, my whole lifetime, who have predicted the end of the world. And I'm not just talking those guys on, with, on, on New York City streets walking up and down with, with cardboard saying the end of the world is near. These are scientists. These are medical professionals. These are cosmologists. These are physicists. These are very smart people who analyze the situation and conclude that our world is coming to an end. And I don't know about you, but when I hear that, I just, I frankly just don't want to think about it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to spend any time having, being in that, that world. But then something happened and that's, you know, when you get to the climate change issue, I'm going to be honest with you, that's the one that really started triggering me. Because when I, when I thought about this, I became convinced that climate change is, is truly legitimate. Um, the impact to human flourishing due to the rising ocean levels. Think of our islands. Think of the fires in California, the weather changes, the consequences of a warming earth. That really grabs my imagination. And I really care about my world. It doesn't take long to show you some examples that affect me. Let me just show you some. This is one thing that I love. This is a glacier. This is a before and after picture of a glacier. And, and this is something I have witnessed uh, firsthand. One of my natural interests is glaciers. I've spent considerable time exploring melting glaciers in Europe, in Italy, in Switzerland, and in North America. I went to Glacier National Park. I love glaciers. I don't know why. I, I like them because they're like a destination to hike to, and I like hiking. And so I do spend time looking at glaciers, but I've noticed at Glacier National Park, these, these huge glaciers in my lifetime, in a span of 10 years, melting and disappearing. And, and, the, and the prediction is by 2030, there will no more, there'll be no more glaciers in Glacier National Park. And that just really, I don't know, there's something sad about that to me. I'll never forget being in Switzerland and, and uh, sitting, uh, this is really nice, sitting in Interlock in Switzerland, looking up at a glacier just at the right moment as, it, as a big chunk of the glacier came tumbling down this cliff. It was, it, the earth shook. It was a dramatic moment. Everybody stopped and set down their coffee and looked because this glacier, this is like an avalanche of a, a piece of a glacier fell off a cliff. I'll never forget that. It made me realize that this is all um, fragile and temporary and it's, and it's transient. These, these beautiful glaciers are gonna pass and it makes me sad. 
Um, you know, then I go to look at animals. I love animals. And this human report, you can, this is something that's being talked about a lot on my internet, you know, as I surf around. That is that there's, there's thousands of species going to an extinction. You know, uh, these are some typical examples just this year of animals, the white rhino, who have died, that have died, that are extinct, that will never see these animals ever again. If you go on the internet and explore this a little bit, you find, oh my gosh, there's thousands of, if you want to go to insects and plants as well, animals and plants that are going to extinction. So what's gripping me in all this is there's a reality there that I've got to face. I've got to deal with the fact that the world's not just going on as it always is. It's getting older. Things are changing. Um, you know, I'm getting older. As I, I'm, I'm 59, just had my birthday a little while ago, and I'm getting older, and I'm realizing, oh, my gosh, like many of you have, you know, I, I'm not that 30-year-old, and I'm, I'm feeling I'm losing my capacities. I'm losing some things. I can't ski as fast as I used to. In fact, I, right now, I can't ski at all because my knee's gone out. And there's gonna be some other things that go out. My teeth are gonna go, my eyes have gone when I was really young. And I'm, I'm feeling that uh, issue of aging. I'm thinking, boy, that is a great analogy to the earth. The earth is aging. A lot of it is dying. And it's, to me, honestly, it, it, it grips me. And I think it grips a lot of you. And it's, you know, it's something that I can't just avoid and say it doesn't, it's not happening. And in fact, you know, the question I have to ask myself is, are humans responsible for causing climate change. Now that's a big question. Why is there climate change? Is it because of Donald Trump? You know, is it because of some president? Is it because how we've, how the America has run the world or how China has polluted the air or how, you know, who are we going to blame for climate change? And that's a huge, obviously a huge political thing, but there's a, there's the sense in, deep inside me, even though I, you know, it's nice to find culprits and, and to see who's responsible and use that to manipulate public opinion, to get political uh, ideologies promoted or whatever, use fear to, to try and trigger the masses to do certain things. You know, even if there was someone responsible that we could identify and clearly say, oh, it's because we have cars, you know, it's because of you know, gas emissions, that's the 100% because we use aerosol cans. That's why we have climate change. You know, it doesn't really, it doesn't really, I don't know for, about you, but it doesn't change anything. I mean, it's, it's sad that we know the reason, but we still have the, the damage that's left over. And so our question is, are we, are we responsible to fix it? Whether we did it or not, can we do something to change it? Is it even possible to change, to reverse, to slow, the change of our world to, you know, some of you, you know, you use Botox and you get, you know, chin lifts and facelifts to try and retard the inevitable that you're getting older. You know, I'm, I probably get some knee surgery before this is all over because I want to ski one more time. You know, I want to do that fast run. And, you know, just like I do for my own body, I'm thinking, is there something we can do for this earth? Can we slow down this inevitable change that we see happening around us? Elon Musk predicts that the inner in world, he says a big rock will cause the extinction of the earth. You know, a lot of the biggest, wealthiest philanthropists in the world recognize this problem. He, you know, he, he gives, an, Elon Musk gives an apocalyptic warning as he says that civilization is to be destroyed in a shock claim. And then just two weeks ago, in light of coronavirus and his, his, his factories being closed down in Northern California, he decided that he needed to start up his company again. And he said, Tesla's restarting production today against Alameda County rules. I'll be on the line with everyone else. If anyone is arrested, I ask it only be me. In other words, in spite of the fact that the world is, that, that he sees the world coming to the end and he sees the coronavirus, he has publicly many times denounced the coronavirus as being a farce, as being not as serious as we think it is, as like the common cold. You can research Elon Musk on that. Here's a man who's typically apocalyptic. Here's a man that debated, uh, invented SpaceX to bring us all to, the, to Mars so we can escape a world that's falling apart. And he, uh, he makes a clear stance that, um, you know, he's, he's afraid of the end of the world as well. A lot of what energizes what he's doing is how the world is falling apart. And yet when it comes to it with the coronavirus, he does not take it seriously. 
Here's Jeff Bezos, the richest man in the world. He pledges $10 billion of his own personal money to fight climate change, the planet's biggest threat. I put this in as a little joke. Kanye West and Kim Kardashian have spent millions of dollars to, to build a bunkers so they can hide during the coronavirus and towards any kind of epidemic. That's one response too. We can just stick our head in the sand and try and make it not affect us. And we're gonna be the last one standing when the world falls apart. Man, I'm gonna be okay because I've got a billion dollar bunker I put out in New Zealand and I, no one can touch me there. And after the nuclear holocaust and after the world falls completely apart, I will come out and I will still be alive. That's some people's vision of what to do with all this stuff. And then today, actually it came out a couple days ago, this article in the Wall Street Journal, Bill Gates has regrets. You know, I don't know if you know uh, Bill Gates, you know, the second wealthiest man in the world. And, uh, and he, uh, in 2018, was loudly proclaiming that there's gonna be a pandemic in the world. He, he foresaw what's happening now with the coronavirus. And so if you read the Wall Street Journal article, it's an interview with him where he talks about, we are not doing enough and we need to do more. And here's a smart man, I mean, he's wealthy, but he's also very informed. And I, I really do appreciate his philanthropic heart, his sense of, of uh, wanting to do something to change the world. And so here's the subtitle, Bill Gates has regrets. Years before the COVID-19 pandemic, the billionaire tried to warn global leaders of the threat from new infectious diseases. Few listened and he says, I feel terrible. He feels bad that he didn't do enough. I don't know if he really feels bad that they didn't do enough. He did a lot back then. You know, what more could he have done? We all say as we read this article, we're sympathetic with him and we admire him for having foreseen this. But we also recognize the fact that, you know, the wealthiest men in the world don't know how to respond to the current situation we live in of climate change, of coronavirus, of all these problems. You know, this year has been a dark, dark year. So far this year in January, fires ravaged Australia and the, the, the damage to that country is apocalyptic. Um, we have had locusts invade Africa. I don't know if you followed that story, but many people's lives have been, there's many people have died and many lives are threatened by the crop devastation of these locusts that have invaded Africa. Of course, we've had our coronavirus, which is affecting the world in a great pandemic, and we have not yet seen the impact it might have, if people are predicting it's gonna to happen, to the third world, to countries that don't have the ability to do what we do, and that is have social distancing and hide for a period of time until we can invent a solution, some kind of uh, antidote to this problem. And so these, we're, we're expecting a lot more deaths. I mean, uh, experts are expecting a lot more deaths, especially in the, uh, the areas where there is no protection and no, no uh, ability to do what we can do. And, and, and because of our wealth, because of our, our, um, our uh, uh, natural infrastructure, we can do what we're doing. Oh, and then you heard last month, you know, these UFOs uh, were sighted. So maybe we're going to get invaded by aliens, by intelligent aliens that are going to come in and take us over. There's the next crisis right there. Or how about the murder hornet? I think maybe, maybe most of us have heard about this murder hornet that's invaded from Asia, and it kills all our bees, and it's coming to take us over. It can kill people. It doesn't take long for these hornets, these huge hornets, to massively kill people, and that's the new fear. And then just yesterday, I heard of a new one. And so this is brand new news, if you haven't heard this yet. Gypsy moths are worse than murder hornets. We should be fearing gypsy moths. They're gonna be devastating our crops this year. And it's gonna be much worse than murder hornets. Check out the news, go on the internet, do your searches. And what you're finding is we are such, this year has been a year of attack. Humans are being attacked. The world is being attacked. What do we do? And that's my, that's just totally engages me. Um, in a recent tweet, the Santiago Meyer, this was put on some website, I thought it was kind of cute. Santiago listed in a tweet uh, every month of the year what we're going through. He says, you know, January, we have World War III. In February, we have the entire continent burns. In March, there's a global pandemic. 
In April, we have UFOs. In May, we have chimp, uh, a chimp uprising. In June, we have a zombie apocalypse. In July, all the glaciers melt. In August, the meteor hits us. September, so he's just counting out what happens. So I love this very last one. In November, we have an election. <sighs> and then the sun destroys us. Anyway, um, but I thought that was kind of cute. But I'm going to just show you this. You know, um, when we get down to the topic of the world coming to, to an end, this is something that, you know, most of us realize this is not a brand new topic. There's been dates predicted for the end of the world since, this is what we have recorded in history since Jesus. How many times the world has been predicted to end? Look at all these dates, 66 to 70. You Jews would understand that as when uh, Rome took over, took over on the Palestine. I could go through each of these dates and point out what was happening at that point in history. We have 1666 because that has 666 in the numbers, the number, the number mentioned revelation of the end of the world. Um, if you look at more modern times, uh, let's go to uh, uh, December 21st, 2012. Uh, that was a, a, a time when the Mayans said that we were going to, predicted that we were all going to die. There's all kinds of dates in here that predict the ends of the world. Predicting the end of the world is not a new thing. And even this year, with all the drama we're experiencing, you know, um, the idea in our subconscious that we're finite and the world's going to end and we're going to end is always there. It's always been a part of our culture in all of history. And it continues today. All right. Um, some of you know I teach philosophy. Oh, here's the last thing I forgot to mention. Sylvia Brown. Some of you heard about this. In 2008, Sylvia Brown, who's, by the way, passed away, she predicted, she's, a, she's one of these futurists. She, she predicts the future like a psychic. She predicted that she's going to live to 80, be 88. She died at 77. So what can we do with her prophecies? But she said this, and this is a best-selling book right now. You can't buy it anymore because it's off the shelves. Um, literally, uh, the hard copies of this go for thousands of dollars. But it says that in around 2020, a severe pneumonia-like illness will spread throughout the globe, attacking the lungs and the bronchial tubes and resisting all known treatments. Almost more baffling than illness itself will be the fact that it'll suddenly vanish as quickly as it arrived. Attack again 10 years later, so 2030, look out, and then disappear completely. So we have psychics and futurists that, that predict calamity. And of course, some of you guys know St. John's Revelation. This is in the Bible, and this gets quoted in so many circles. I'm a New Testament, uh, New Testament scholar, right? I know Revelation pretty well. In fact, if you're interested in Revelation, I'll, I'll give a, a small plug. Take my class this summer on uh, Bible as literature, Gospels to Revelation. I spent a, about three or four sessions just explaining Revelation. I know some of you are interested in that. Sign up for that class. You might... Uh, you might enjoy it, but you know how many Christians believe that the book of Revelation describes the end of the world, and even, uh, even people who have never read the Bible are familiar with, with its references like the four horsemen of the apocalypse, or 666, that comes from the book of Revelation, or there's this beast and the false prophet who are going to come at the end of the world. And at the very end, a son of man enters on a white horse and conquers all and reigns. It's all, there's a lot of symbolism and weird animals and numbers that are really strange. And at the very end, the book of Revelation, here comes this son of man entering on a white horse and conquering all and reigning. And the book of Revelation was the author's way of encouraging Christians that despite dark times of oppression, darkness, and evil, God and justice would ultimately prevail. Eh, it's a pretty happy, positive message for Christians, right? And so that's why people are interested in Revelation. Now, I tell you what, people are re really interested in Revelation. They love the doom issues. They love the issue of evil and, and seeing that Donald Trump is the Antichrist or, you know, your favorite enemy, whoever, Obama was the Antichrist, you know, eight years ago. And so we can, you, can, you can find the Antichrist in, in whatever president you don't like. You can find the Antichrist in anything. At this, at this point, but people love using the Bible to try and find, to try to give meaning to the, the modern situation, that our world is falling apart. 
And my question is, what are some reasons why we obsess with predicting the end? Why is this part of our subconscious? I think people touch in, tap into something that we all recognize that we have this fear. Whether or not it's legitimate or not is not the question. The reality is, is we are very aware of our mortality. We're very aware of uh, the fragile world we live in. And people can use that fear or concern or, in some cases, optimism. <laughs> some people want to keep going, I, yeah, okay. And they, um, they use it to give a message. So some people use this idea of ends to draw attention to the moral decline and the current crises that exist in this world. So they project the great ultimate consequences of general moral decay or events like war, disasters, or pestilence. I've heard people say, you know, the world is going to die and just be judged by God because of Hollywood, because of all the sex and violence we see in our culture today, or drug addictions, or people, uh, racism, or uh, hatred. And you know what's really interesting in all this thing? People, people associate the end of the world with justice with moral consequences. And we can see that. I can see that in this sense. You know, we, a lot of things we do that are, that, that, that are, are, I think of North Korea, nuclear arms. Um, a lot of things, it's not everything, but many things we do do bring uh, destruction of some kind. Uh, whether it's biological or, you know, or global is, is one thing. Um, but there are things that happen in life. There are consequences in our personal lives. When we do something we don't like and we get bad consequence, consequences for it, I'm a philosopher, I'm a theologian, I'm a philosopher, and one thing I'm very aware of for all history, all philosophy has worked out of the assumption that we live in a cause-effect universe. Everything that happens, happens because of something. We live in a cause-effect universe, and so... You know, when we see the world falling apart, people can tap on our fears of get, being sick, illness, and they can motivate us to do a lot of things. People can talk about, look at the world's falling apart. Look at, them, look at um, how America, sometimes we, we separate, or China, we vilify the whole country, we vilify all of America, and we say, this is happening, all this bad stuff is happening because of something moral. And or because of some bad political decision, which leads to another reason why we talk about this. And that, you know, if we can um, tap on people's fears, we can get people to vote a certain way. Or we can get people to convert to my religion and we can get a lot of money out of you. <laughs> well, maybe it's money. Sometimes it is. In history, we find that a lot of religious people do it for financial gain or for different bizarre reasons. I, I'm, I'm obviously in the world of the New Testament. I've got my biblical studies qualifications. Well, in that world, of course, I deal with religions. And I've seen, and you know, you have seen as well. You don't have to be an expert in this. You've seen it as well. Whether it's in the guise of Christianity or the guise of Buddhism or the guise of different religions, Islam, um, religions that can focus us on consequences, karma, or uh, death, or uh, uh, the end of the world and God, God's coming in judgment, to promote religious belief and get adherence to different religious systems. By creating doom scenarios, populations or legislators are motivated to unite around ideology and search for saviors. I don't know how many people in my world Tell me I should vote based on consequences, but not just with the climate change issue. It's so clear. We have to do stuff because of the world coming to an end. The world's, gonna, the world's coming to an end because of you're not voting correctly. You're responsible for what's happening out there, friend. If you just voted correctly, we wouldn't have these problems. And I have a problem with that. And I think most of you do too when I say it that clearly. But the reality is, is it works. Most of us have a little bit of anxiety underlying it. We have a little bit of fear. And so the politicians know that and they'll talk about that and they'll play to it. 
But one thing I really think is very interesting in all this is there's a lot of justice issues involved here. There's a lot of judgment being thrown around. You're responsible. You are right. You are wrong. The president is right or wrong. And I'm not, woo, I'm not trying to get in that too closely, but I'm trying to say this. We spent a lot of time uh, struggling with, uh, with our own sense of responsibility and the responsibility of others for what we experience as pain. And it's obvious that the machine out there, the, the, every from Madison Avenue, politicians, religions, anybody who wants to persuade you will tap into that anxiety and that fear to motivate you to do things. There's a third reason I'm going to talk about, about why we are obsessed with predicting the end, and that is this. And it's so, to me, clear and obvious. It's been with me my whole life. And that is that it's taught in religious texts, including the Abra Abrahamic faiths. Probably more clearly, I come from that tradition. I'm, I grew up in a Christian home here in Orange County, uh, in Tustin. And so I went to church as a kid. In all my life, I grew up in, I was born in 61. I grew up in the 60s, 70s. Um, I was told all my life that uh, the commies were going to come take us over. Communism was the enemy back when I was growing up. And so we need to be ready because the end of the world might be happening soon because, wow, this is a huge thing we need to be afraid of. It's so big. It's so big. And, um, uh, I was always told the world might come to an end at any time. You need to be ready for the world end. And boy, as a, as a young person, that was really uh, something that shocked me and intrigued me too. I remember in high school reading lots of books about the end of the world. I don't know if you know Hal Lindsey. He's a local here in California somewhere. I think he's still with us and going strong. I, I've not had any contact with him in about 20, 30 years. But when I was in high school, I read his books. And some of you have too, just knowing, I know my demographic. You know, you grew up in the 70s when, you know, this doomsday end of the world talk was being given in a religious context. But that springs from something very genuine. And that is that Abrahamic faith traditions, and I'm talking about the Bible and the Quran, both talk about justice and both talk about judgment. And judgment is a final judgment. Obviously, you don't judge someone before they do something wrong. You judge them afterwards. And there's a sense of a cumulative judgment. Um, if, if I know the scriptures really well. I know the Hebrew scriptures as well, friends. It's not just the New Testament. And if you look there, what you find is Yahweh, the God of the Jews, uh, who has a covenant relationship with them. One of, the, one of the struggles in the Hebrew scriptures is he's trying to coax his people, his covenant people, to become righteous, and they don't want it. And uh, I, I say this with frankness, but also I don't want to offend anybody, but if you read Moses, if you read the last chapters of Deuteronomy, the Torah, or if you follow the history of Israel, if you read the last book of the Hebrew scriptures, either Chronicles, if you're a Jew, because that's the last book in the, in the Hebrew canon, or Malachi, if you're a Christian, because the Protestant Bible puts Malachi at the end, one of the prophets, you find that it's not looking very good for, the, for Israel in either place. In both places, what you find is Israel in the midst of trying to recover from exile after being exiled by God in judgment um, because they didn't follow him and they weren't righteous and justice had fallen on them. And they were anticipating hope, hope, hoping for redemption, hoping for what they're looking for. They're looking for Messiah that will deliver them from Rome and restore them as a nation. I won't go lengthy long into Islam because, first of all, I'm not an expert in Islam. I know that a lot of us feel like, oh, you've heard the stories that Islam just preaches that we go to, they, they, they bomb buildings. This is a, a total caricature of, of Islam that I disagree with because I have very good friends that are Muslim. But the, the Muslims are the kind of people that bomb buildings so they can go to paradise and be with a bunch of virgins. That's a story. That's a uh, caricatured story that's been passed through. That is something that is not that explicitly said, said in the Quran. The Quran definitely does reward uh, Muslims for uh, faithfulness and submission to Allah, and it does punish those people that are not, uh, that are infidels. 
and it's a temporal punishment that they have uh, the Islamic faith. I won't go into a lot of detail there because I honestly, I don't know it is from the inside and I don't feel as much of an authority about it. But um, there's a sense of uh, temporal judgment, like in this life, um, apocalyptic ideas, uh, you, you can have your, you can have a, uh, in this life, a sense of um, return for, for, for good as well. And that's something that's not talked about as much in my circles, but that's a part of Islamic faith. But then Christian eschatology, which I know really well, builds off the idea of Jesus's return to establish the kingdom of God on a new heaven and a new earth. And uh, a lot of you are familiar with this, even if you're not Christians, I find a lot of people in our culture understand that this is the Christian idea, that this world is going to come to an end, Christians believe, and that Jesus is going to return to establish the kingdom of God. So what I'm trying to say in this is this, um, you know, some people think the Bible is 100% uh, uh, sensationalist, um, National Enquirer type mag, trying to provoke people through sensationalistic false exaggerated news to inc with good motives some people say well jesus the whole idea of jesus he's not really true but um this story was created to encourage and help people and some people say the whole story of jesus coming back in the end of the world is totally a um it's a fabrication to help people or to warn people or to motivate people's behavior by the way, in the first century, there's a lot of apocalyptic literature that's not Christian. You can do your own research on this. You know, from 200 BC and, and, uh, and well, actually from as far back as 600 BC, this kind of literature that sensationalizes uh, a, a judgment of God uh, in Sumerian religions, uh, it's not unique to Christianity. It was a period of time when this kind of literature was very popular. And Rev God, John's revelation fits right into that. It mimics a lot of, like First Enoch would be a great example of an intertestamental literature, literature before the New Testament and after the Old Testament that uses this kind of literature of animals and numbers and symbolism to predict a judgment. <clears throat> but I will say this, from my perspective, and I'm a conservative New Testament scholar, I think, you know, uh, John used that genre to do something, and, he, and I think he really existed. And I think he really believed there's a historical event. There's a time space event coming when the world will end. And I think he's trying to describe it accurately in the form of visions. And I think he may have even had, a, this is my conservative perspective. I think the Bible is inspired by God and um, revealed. I think God wants to have a relationship with us. So I'm, I'm pretty conservative with this whole thing. I believe in a literal God and miracles and supernatural. I'm a supernaturalist. I know for some of you, it sounds radical, radically uh, extreme to believe in miracles, but I do. I believe also in the resurrection of Jesus, and I believe, uh, I believe the Bible is God's words. So there's my conviction. I know I got to see that bias. You'd know it anyway if you talk to me for very long. You know, I'm a scholar. I've done a lot of work. I've done a lot of work. I've doubted my, what I believe now before and analyzed and scrutinized to see if it, how, and, and through that, I've actually come to a more solid faith in these issues, and I say it's faith. It's not that I know anything. I, I believe it. But I say all that because I want you to hear my bias and prejudice as I walk into this. Um, there's a real reason why there's a lot of end of world belief and thought and talk. And maybe some of you come from a Christian perspective and you 100% agree with what I'm saying, that, that, that you see that Christianity teaches the hope of the world is in something future. And uh, other you, other you, you come from, we all come from different traditions. So I'm not trying to promote my tradition, but I'm trying to say that one reason for this isn't sensational necessarily. It wasn't there to motivate us or to, or to create a crisis to get us to jump and get on the internet and start looking for signs of the return of Jesus. In fact, Jesus himself famously said that no one knows when I will return. He says he's going to return. He says, no one knows. I don't even know when I'm going to return. Only the Father knows that. So I'll just say that as a caveat to everything else I'm going to say here. But when I started thinking about all this, I started thinking about something, and that is the different um, beliefs. So here, the first question we need to ask is, excuse me, is um, whether or not the world is really going to end. Is it all speculation? Is it certain? Is, there, is climate change real? 
you know, there's a lot of people, maybe many of you who don't believe the climate change is real. What about overpopulation? That's something that I see as a huge issue of the last century that's been promoted as the way, reason why the world's going to end. We have international conflicts. That's, no, that's a no-brainer. North Korea, China, America, we have lots of issues there. There's wars and nuclear threats. In my lifetime, I've been afraid of a nuclear bomb, a, a, a nuclear bomb falling on America and, and destroying me. Um, we're, are we consuming of our resources? That ties in the overpopulation issue. There's locusts and wildfires and earthquakes. We live in California. You chose to live here. You got to deal with it. There's, are we on, the, this is a new popular thing. Dan Brown just wrote this article on, uh, what is it? Uh, origins or beginnings or, I forget it. Oh, well, but anyway, he, his big story there talks about there's the next stage of evolution that renders us extinct. So if we think of it, there's species behind us that have gone extinct because we've superseded them. And his projection is that we're going to become this be a human and artificial intelligence that's going to become biological. It's going to have life. And that's a whole idea there. What about diseases and plagues? So obviously, we're dealing with, with the coronavirus. Is it real? Elon Musk doesn't think so. He thinks it's like the common cold. Now, you know, what are you going to, what are we going to do with that? There's a lot of people here that don't want to think it's real. And if you don't understand, that's a real issue. Some people think it's real. Some people think it's dumb. It isn't real. What about God's final judgment? Some of you think that God is judging us for our sins and we're, we're messed up. One thing is, is clear. Um, the question is not if the world is going to end, but when. I don't know what you think about all those things, but I will say this, and this is from a cosmological perspective. The world is going to come to an end. It, um, it, I, I, could, I could demonstrate this scientifically, um, and I could show that, uh, you know, it, it may be billions of years from now. It's not necessarily going to happen in our lifetime or even in our children's, children's, children's lifetime, but the world is going through a process of change, slow, but sure, and any cosmologist would tell you that our universe is expanding, and what that means is... Um, energy is dissipating and we are becoming, we are eventually, the world is going to end. So just that thought that it's possible that the world's going to end. As a philosopher, I start asking lots of questions. And the first thing is, I think, well, how, okay, the world's going to end, Greg. What, what am I supposed to do with that? Well, the first thing you might be feeling is uh, you might be feeling afraid. Oh my gosh, what do I need to do? Now, uh, um, I think that my first response to that is fear doesn't help anybody. Fear is really a helpful emotion if there's a fire in the house, if there's a dangerous situation right imminent. You know, fear does help us. It's a biological reaction that's really helpful to get us to uh, make immediate decisions, crisis decisions to get out of things. A lot of us, though, feel a low-lying anxiety constantly. It takes your sleep. It makes you not want to eat. It gets you to be irritable with your, with your loved ones. That kind of fear is not helpful. It's not productive. So the, one of the reasons I walk into this whole question is because I don't, I want to try and help some of you that are living in fear to think about this a little bit. So maybe you can work that out a little bit and not be so afraid and be more resolved in your mind how to face this. That's one reason that I got into New Testament studies to help resolve some of my tensions and anxieties I was feeling about the whole religious thing. And I, I hope I can help you, some of you with that today. Should we feel anger? All right, someone's responsible. Let's find a person responsible and kill them. <laughs> Let's do something to them. Let's make them conform. Let's stop this thing. Ah. And maybe that's your response. I'm not saying that's a totally wrong response. I'm angry. I'm angry at pedophiles. I'm angry at when I see moral injustice in society, racism, I get angry. And it's an appropriate reaction. But the problem is, is a lot of times I can't sustain my anger. I can't even sustain my fear, actually, to do anything constructive. What about guilt? Oh, we're responsible. Should we wallow in guilt about what's going on? Oh, I drive a car. I'm responsible for this. Oh, and I'm not going to stop driving a car. Oh. And we have this tension. We think, oh, we're causing the problem. Should we wrestle with guilt? 
How about just sadness and grief? You know, grief is the emotion you have when you experience loss. We're losing things. You know, when my knee popped out skiing one day, I couldn't ski the rest of that day. Uh, that was a bad day. That was a day of depression, of grief. I thought, oh, I'm changing permanently. I'll never go back to being the young guy I used to be. We're never going to go back to a world where there's glaciers. You know, they're just not going to be any more glaciers until we go through another ice age, which destroys all the world as we know it. And it returns back to this. <sighs> wow. These animals are going extinct. We'll never have them back. We'll never have the white rhinoceros again. We'll never have the, uh, the dolphin that's in the Yangtze River. I forget the name of it. Uh, uh, and, you know, these animals are gone. We'll never see them. They'll never be on this earth again. Um, how about repentance? You know, this is what a lot of people, the religious people would tell us, and maybe even the political people. You need to change from being a Republican to being a Democrat. You need to repent. You need to change from being a Democrat to being a Republican. You need to repent. <laughs> it goes on politics. It goes with religion. Some of you know I teach a free thought class, and that's what we discuss is how do we become people who can think independently of these dogmatic voices that, that, that tell us how we're supposed to think and how we're supposed to live. And then how are we supposed to find our own way in this whole process? Well, the heart of the matter for me is not just about the end of the world. In other words, I, I care about the world coming to an end. The world's gonna come to an end after I die. That's one thing I'm convinced of. Or if it does, I will die with it. And I'm not really gonna experience much of the consequences of the world coming to an end. That's something to think about. So I'll talk to you, I wanna to talk to you a little about the end of the world and how cosmologists and philosophers talk about it and theologians talk about it. But one thing I really do care about is humanity. And maybe that gets a little closer to home. You know, I, I can picture a planet that keeps spinning around and there's no humans on it, but humans have gone extinct. And that's a very sad vision. And so I'm thinking a lot about people. And what's the end of the humanity? How's that going to end? And that's where a lot of the apocalyptic movies out of Hollywood talk about. They, you know, not about the end of the universe or the end of the world, but they're talking about the end of humans. And then I think about me as a person. I'm not, I'm not going to talk a lot about death, frankly, today. Because if you want to talk about that, it's what my, my doctoral dissertation was on, mortality. And I'll talk about this some other time. I talk about it in some of my classes. I'll mention it shortly here. But what I really want to talk about is this uh, aspect of the end of the world. And what I want to talk about it, let me just talk about the end of the material world really quickly to get that out, 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 out of the way. The end of the material world, how is it all going to end? Um, well, there's, there's three religious perspectives. And I'm going to put them up here. Uh, one is atheism. Some of you are in this, are watching this are atheists. You don't believe in, uh, in God. You, you, you believe the whole world is a material world. It's a material world. There isn't a soul. There isn't an immaterial soul. Even as we as humans, some of you believe that we're 100% material. What we think of as a soul is a projection of our brains and synapses, a very in intricate and complicated brain function is this projection that we exist outside of our physical world. You're an atheist. Some of you are pantheists, and what you believe is <clears throat> the world, the material world, the nature, you, well, natural world you look around in is itself God. There is a God. It's this God that holds things together, and, and, and the world itself is God. So as, as the world gets scarred, it's God himself is getting scarred. And, and you, if you're a pantheist or a panentheist, that means that some people believe that the world is material, that, that, excuse me, that God is material, but God also has a soul outside the material world. And so the universe is God's body, but his soul is behind it. So as, a, as the universe, as the material world gets scarred or expands or whatever, that is an expression of God expanding or being scarred. Or, or In other words, God can change. He can mutate. And that's what <clears throat> uh, the early philosophers, Plato and Aristotle, argued against. Well, no, they argued for the material world changes, but the soul, the immaterial world never changes. And uh, we can talk about that, take my intro to philosophy class, and I'll tell you about that. But anyway, and then there's the last ones, and they're theists. What do theists believe? Theists believe that God is outside the world, outside the material world, the whole universe, a huge universe, and it's expanding. But God is somehow not tied into that material world. He's changeless. And he's actually intelligent, 
and he is a creator. He's outside of time and space, he's intelligent, and he's a creator. Some of you have heard these words like omniscient, he knows everything, he's omnipotent, he's all powerful, he's omnipresent in time and space, he's in all space and all time at the same time. So he's in the future, he's in the past. And that's classic definitions of God, he's eternal, he's infinite. Of, of when we talk about God, that's how he's described. Well, there's some people like me that have this view, and that is that there's a creator God outside the world who created the universe, and what is their view of the end? Let's talk about atheism first. Atheism in the end, the material order operates by cause and effect or proceeds by chance. So there's a chance component to how the world proceeds, but everything we see in this world has a cause, and, and there are people that trace causes back to original cause. So what you, when you trace it all the way back, where do you get to? Well, most cosmologists, this is the most popular theory by far, is the Big Bang Theory. The Big Bang is, is a prevalent theory for beginnings, but fundamental questions remain as to the ultimate origin of energy and matter. And there's lots of questions about the end in an expanding universe. So there's people that say that the world expands and contracts. There's people that say you know, it expands forever. The universe, I see the world. The universe expands forever. What happens as it's expanding is energy is being dissipated. And some people say it creates a vacuum, then it comes back. Um, there's all kinds of ways of conceiving um, how the world got, how the universe got started. By the way, the problem with the Big Bang Theory, and every cosmologist would have to, does admit this, we don't know what happened in the first few nanoseconds of creation, of the beginning. What started the Big Bang? Where did matter and energy come from to begin with? That's a question that's left open. But the second law of ter thermodynamics or entropy declares that all matter and energy are seeking a constant and will eventually reach some as yet undefined neutral state. Everything's going down to neutral. The material world will eventually fizzle out. Climate change is real, but it's just, as a, a, just a small, piece of what's happening across the whole universe. The whole universe is winding down. The universe is getting older, it's aging. If you think of this, there's a timeline. There's a beginning and an end to this form of scientific atheism. Something had to start it. And, and the reason why scientists believe that is they see motion and they see development and they, and, and they see trajectory. They believe in a cause effect universe if, if they see stars moving away from each other, they can project that at one time they were close to each other. And that's how the Big Bang Theory gets its, gets its start. Um, it's just natural physics. It's natural laws working. And that's an atheist then say, that the, science, the scientific atheists say that things have a beginning and things have an end. In that sense, they, they're very similar to theists. And I'll get to that in just a second. Pantheists, though, are a little bit different. Pantheists say that the human self retains that the world is God, that the world is God, or part of God's material essence. The physical essence of God is thus mutating with the expanding universe. So um, the material world is changing, but God is changing. I don't know if you've been out in nature like I have, and you look at a beautiful sunset, and you go, wow, this is in some way, I don't understand it. It's beyond my comprehension. It's so beautiful. It is transcendent. There's something happening here that's more than what I'm seeing. It's bigger. I, I've done this with plants. I, I stare at a leaf. And I go, wow, that is the most interesting, complicated, uh, just a leaf, a leaf from a tree. And I look and I, and I start thinking, I'm, 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 I'm struck with a sense of awe or the sense of wonder. And a pantheist might do that and say, oh, this is God. This is Godlike. I am in touch, as I get in touch with nature, I am communicating with something transcendent, bigger than me. And it's, I'm part of the, the life force. I'm part of a movement of energy in the universe. And pantheists, many of them trying to meditate or get in touch with that life force, with their Buddhahood, if you're a Buddhist. And um, as far as ends are concerned, they, uh, uh, pantheists typically, a lot of them believe in reincarnation, a popular view of the end of this view. Matter and the life force is not linear, but cyclical. 
it's not that it has a beginning and an end, but it's going around in a circle, in a cycle. And immaterial souls leave their bodies. And then after 32 or 49 days, if you're a Buddhist, and there's different discrepancies as to how long it takes, your, your soul leaves your body, and then it comes into another body. It reincarnates. So you have had different, your soul has had different past lives that you don't remember. By the way, Plato believed that. He believed that um, you have a soul, your soul is pre-existent. Um, I, I wouldn't call Plato a Buddhist, but at the same time, he believed in a, a pre-existent soul. And your soul is constant. It comes in, it materializes, in, in, in re, it incarnates, it becomes fleshed, and then it leaves, and it comes, after you die, it comes back into another flesh. And what's constant is this material world that's going on constantly in a cycle, but it's constant. Matter is eternal, and it's cyclical. The apocalypse is both an end and a beginning. It's okay to die. You'll be okay because you're coming back. Your, your soul's eternal. You're coming back as something. And that's the view of reincarnation. There's obviously issues of karma and judgment in this whole, this whole thing, and I'm not going to get into that right now. Let me talk about theism. Theism, Abrahamic religions hold to an intelligent, personal God who's outside of space and time, who has planned both the beginning and the end of the material world. As the creator, he engages his creation and distinctively in Christianity incarnates, Jesus comes into the world, God becomes a man, which is very unusual. If you think of the Greco-Roman uh, Greco, uh, religions, there's a lot of ideas of gods becoming men or becoming fleshly or human. Well, in Christianity, there's this idea that God incarnates. What makes you a God? You can't die. That immortality is one of the ideas of what makes someone something a God. And God can't die, but Jesus dies. But then, of course, he rises again from the dead. Um, so he demonstrates a personal reaction. God demonstrates a personal reaction with the created material order. He's not just transcendent. He's also what we call imminent, or he's relational. He's personal. He cares about his creation. Now, Christians would say he doesn't just care in, a, in an abstract way. He actually um, created man in his image. And one thing, that, one thing that that means is that he can communicate with us. So he uses words to communicate with us. That's, and, and so we have the ability, a God-like ability to, to think abstractly, to use words and, to, and to, to relate to each other. There's different eschatological schema that are devised, usually by those who claim to have a revelatory or prophetic understanding of the mind of this God. So God, according to this view, God actually tells people what's going to happen at the end. He, God lives in the future as well as the past. He's in all time. And he can communicate and give little hints to help us prepare for a future. He wants us to think in terms of goals and purpose. And a lot of you, some people take my philosophy class and they say, Hey, Greg, well, I'm here in this class. This is why I take it, because I want to find what the meaning of life is, what the purpose of life is. From a Christian's perspective, um, I don't know if you've read, a uh, Mormon wrote this book, uh, uh, Covey, uh, the, uh, Seven Habits of a Highly Effective People. His third uh, habit, or second habit, is begin with the end in mind. Start with your death and what you want people to say in your legacy and work your way backward and try and be, be, become now that which you want to become before you die. Not a bad idea. Well, what the Bible does is it tells us how it's all going to end. And so it motivates you to align your life with reality. If that's, the, if that's our trajectory, well, the meaning of life or the purpose of life is to fit into that trajectory somehow. So the world's going to end apocalyptically. And I'll explain what that means in just a second. There's an apocalyptic end with divine intervention. And suddenly, in a final act of judgment, so... The way the Revelation talks about it, and this is the way Jesus talked about it too, by the way. It's also the way that Paul talked about it. This way the whole Bible talks about it. And I can show you that. If you take my New Testament class, we do talk about this a bit. But there's an apocalyptic, sudden, divine intervention that stops the world. That's the end of humanity. It's not just going to fizzle out and become neutral, like scientists would say. No, God, the creator, he started it all. He's also going to end it all suddenly. And, and then John will talk about a new heaven, a new earth. He creates a new universe for his people to, to be in for eternity. That's how the Bible talks about it. 
Yeah, it sounds a little fantastical as I say it now, but on the other hand, um, it isn't, uh, it's, it, it's also fantastical to believe in Jesus at all in one sense, in the sense that if it wasn't revealed to me, I would never come up with that myself. And I have a hard time believing humans would have come up with that themselves. But I believe it's, it's, it's revealed truth. So that's how Christians talk about this and deal with this. I'm going to talk about um, just one little corollary of this idea, and that is that um, Muslims and Jews find their identity in their past with their descent from Abraham. This is really important for me as I look at world religions. Um, there, when I look at world religions, even like Buddhism and Hinduism, Asian religions, Confucianism, Taoism, but as I look at uh, any religion, I'm asking what is their perception of time? How do they look at their past and how do they look at their future in terms of their personal identity? And I just have been thinking about this a little bit. I'm thinking about how Muslims and Jews find their identity in their past with the descent from Abraham. So what makes uh, a Muslim a Muslim? Well, it's, can I convert to, is, into Islam? Of course I can. It's a belief system. But uh, my Muslim friends are Arabic, and they, uh, and, they, and they come from a tradition in a world of Islam. And one reason they're Muslims is because they were born into um, Islam. My Jewish friends, I ask them, why are you Jewish? Did you convert into Judaism? Oh, no. Oh, no. I, I, <laughs> I was born a Jew. My mother's a Jew. My grandmother's a Jew. And it trace, they trace their lineage back. It's a racial thing. But they're looking backward to find their religious identity. Jews look, and if, as far as going forward, I'll just talk about the Jews, I, the Jewish perspective. They're looking for, this is, this, I, I'll say many Jews, because not all Jews are the same. All Jews trace their identity back to some historic roots to Abraham, ultimately. But Jews look forward to a Messiah. So when they look forward at, their, at, at, their, at what's, what's to come, their anticipation of salvation, if you want to call it, or deliverance, and we just celebrated Pas uh, Passover or Easter for Christians, Passover for Jews, there's this idea of an anticipation of deliverance. And uh, they're looking for a Messiah. Mo many Jews are Messianic. They believe that there's this Messiah or a Savior or a Christ. Or a Christ is, by the way, the Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah. And, and they're looking for some Savior to come in and deliver us and establish Israel and bring peace and justice to this world. Don't we all care about justice? You know, I hear a lot of talk about freedom. I hear a lot of talk about peace. But when I hear about Me Too movement, when I hear about racism, when I hear about, when I see the marginalized poor, when I see the injustices in this world, I want that righted. And, you know, you can believe in karma. That's one way of thinking about how to make this world a better place. The Jewish perspective is there's a God to whom we're responsible who is just. And they're looking to, to him to come in with authority and bring justice to this world. Christians kind of share that idea, that view that's, what, 3,000 years old, maybe, depending on what your take is on history. But Christians don't find their identity in their history. You know, I come, I, I've traced my ancestry back to England, and my mom's German. Um, actually, I've People have traced my, my grandfather traced my ancestry back all the way to Turkey. This is 1000 AD before England was settled. I don't know how they know all this stuff, but that's a whole nother thing. Um, I don't find my identity in my history. I don't know what my, I maybe have Jewish blood in me. I don't think so, but I might. I don't think I have Arabic blood in me. I don't know what my history is that going back that far. Most Jews do. I don't. So I don't find my identity in my history, but I do find, Christians do find their identity in this idea of um, a belief in the future. And so it's one of these crazy things about, I'll say at least evangelical Christians, because the word Christian is thrown around a lot and often used in a way that, you know, evangelicals would say, evangelicals are distinct and that they believe in the Bible is God's words. They believe in the cross as a means of salvation. They believe in conversion, and they believe in activism. Those are the four qualities of evangelicals. 
So uh, they believe in the Bible, they believe in the cross, they believe in conversion, they believe in activism, being socially active based on your faith. And so that's, but not all Christians believe all that, but evangelicals do. And I call myself an evangelical at this point, even though I don't like some of the connotations of hating certain groups or whatever. That's a politicizing my, my name, but that's, that's okay. But what I do, th which I find interesting is, whereas Jews and Arabs and other religions find their um, roots in, their, in their, their past, Christians find their identity in their history, what they anticipate happening. And um, real quickly, I'm, I'm running on short on time. I just want to talk very quickly about um, eschatology for, versus apocalypticism. And that is this, and I'm going to go through this very quickly. But um, there's two approaches to the end. One sees the end of the world happening now, and we need to focus on the now. Apocalyptic people think that the world is going to be a better place in the future. It's called now, not yet theology. I use those words because it's thrown around a lot in my circles. Um, and uh, people who are in the eschatology camp prepare eschatologically for an uncertain future. They're seeing life in the now. Um, whereas an apocalyptic person sees life in the future, and so they're preparing for a certain future. They know the world's going to end, and so they're preparing now for the world to the end. In this life, this, this, the, the one camp believes in the creation is going to fizzle out slowly. In the other camp, uh, there's going to be a dramatic final end to the world. Um, the eschatological camp, and I'm using those terms loosely, eschatology just means end times, Apocalyptic has this idea of dramatic end at the end of the world. Um, people in this camp typically are looking to improve this world. People in that camp can tend to wait for the next world, sit back and just read, read the internet and wait for Jesus to come back. Um, this world believes in a universal salvation. Everybody's going to be saved. We need to save the whole world. This one has a tendency, and I, this is a criticism of my camp, because I find myself over here, is that there's only a few people we need to worry about. Um, eschatology is, what I'll call, use the word post-millennial, and I, I don't get into that now. Uh, come to my class, and I'll explain it to you for my intro philosophy class. Pre-millennial believes that God's return is, is going to reign. Um, human activity and effort, we need to use human activity and efforts now to have a better world. This view Science thinks that it's a total divine activity and it's a dramatic intervention and humans are passive over here. And it's a criticism of my view, um, of the view that I hold, the camp that I'm in. And I don't agree with it, okay, with some of the things that happen there. Over here, we have our correct present systems. That, um, uh, we need to correct our present systems and restore this world. This view says we need to prepare for the destruction and the replacing of this world. So this world loses its importance for these people over here. These people, it's all important. All we have is this world. We need to do something with it to extend it out. This world says, well, yeah, we do need to do something maybe, but it's going to end anyway. What's important is God that's above all, all, all of it. This view resists death and finds all meaning in the present life. This view embraces death. I can't wait to die. I've, I have some friends that say, well, I'm... You know, the Apostle Paul said this. He said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. To die is gain. Why would he say something like that? That's Philippians 1, 21 in the Bible. Why did he say that? Because he's looking forward to this future that he believes is going to happen, where he's going to be with God. It's not about nature. It's about God. It's not about the material world. It's about his relationship with God. So they're looking forward to death in the future. Eschatology view can it emphasize social justice now this other view sees justice as something future when jesus comes back or when the world comes to an end or when the messiah shows up and then there'll be justice i just want to suggest those ideas as thoughts to think about as, as, as the ways that we go on, on looking at this world and i'm going to end with this slide um, how do you end well some people say we should just resign, turn off the TV, turn off the internet, um, drink a lot of alcohol, and sit back and relax because there's nothing we can do about it. And we just need to sit back and just enjoy the last days of our life before the coronavirus takes us all, or climate change burns us up, or something's going to happen. Other people renounce it. No, we've got to fight against it. We've got to do something about it, which falls into this idea of, 
And I think of three words, resuscitation. We need to resuscitate. We need to bring this world back to life again. It's all we have. We need to do something about it. That's one thing that's, and I, you know, so I commend people that have that, of that perspective and are trying to motivate me to do something to save the whales or save the extinct species or make this world a better place. Um, the reincarnationist, that's another view. And that is, hey, just have peace in your life. You've got to realize we can go slowly and peacefully into our end, knowing that we're going to come back. The material world is fine. We will come back into this world as, as souls. And even when the material world ends, it's, gonna, it's a cycle. It's going to come back. It's going to recreate itself. No worries. Have peace. And then there's this final view, and that's the resurrection view. It's the view I hold. It's the view that I, as a Christian, I hold. And that's this idea that um, there is a God. Um, that's really in control of all things. He's a good God. Um, he's into life and he's into nature. He made nature, this beauty that awes me and inspires me. And he's very, he loves it and he wants more of it. And, uh, and, and, and whatever my future holds, I'm not just into his art. I'm into the artist himself. And so my future involves a new creation, a new heaven, and a new earth. This is an apocalyptic perspective. And I am working hard in this world because I love this world. I love nature. And I get out in it and I enjoy it. I, will, I invest money and I invest time into, our, into this world. But I'm also not afraid because I recognize that my future looks bright. And I just wanted in this time together this opportunity I had to speak to you all, to talk to the realm of philosophy, theology, my New Testament background, my own living out in the quarantine and this whole experience. I wanted to share with you these thoughts, um, maybe to encourage you, maybe to show you different ways of looking at this, more perspective. I'm happy to email with any one of you. My, my address is gjanks at saddleback.edu or take one of my classes. In Emeritus, I do Intro to Philosophy, where we talk about this. I did this exact lecture in a lengthier form. Can you believe it? Longer than that? Yeah. And uh, and I I can I, I can take my uh, free thought class or take my New Testament class or my Bible classes where we talk about the biblical perspective of this. So there's other ways of developing these ideas that this interests you. But I really want I want you to know that I think there's a reason for hope and a reason for peace in this world, even as it is. And I hope you, as you're sitting there quarantined and you're watching me on your computer, on the internet, that you'll, um, that you'll actually find maybe this is not such a morbid, dark talk after all, but you'll see that there's a lot of positive with this. All right, thank you very much. Um, I, I appreciate so much, uh, again, Laura and Dan, giving me the opportunity to be here. Wow, thank you, Dr. Jenks. That was an incredible talk. I, I learned so much, and there's so many different ways to think about it. And I just say, wow, the future for the world looks really bleak. You pointed out that throughout history, we have been obsessing about the end of days. And I remember in the 1980s, uh, a Soviet nuclear blast would kill us all. And then in 1997, during the sighting of the Hale-Bopp comet, uh, you might remember a, a local cult called Heaven's Gates all killed themselves. And, and then in 2012, many people thought the Earth's calendar ran out. And it goes on. Why, why do you think it's particularly important to, to think about that? And what can we do? And I, I think it's a great question. A lot of people ask that, you know, we recognize that people get manipulated by talking about these great things that might happen. You know, it is possible, by the way, it's always possible that an asteroid will hit us. And we'll, that's what, that's what Aaron, um, Musk thinks. You know, it's possible that we'll fall into a black hole. It's possible that new, that someone's going to push a button and we're all going to be destroyed in nuclear. We don't know. It could happen today. You know, we're always aware of, the, of potential imminent destruction, you know, and by the same token, you could get out today. This may be the day. You know, more than half the people in the world do not know that they're going to die 15 minutes before they die. Most people in the world die of an accident or a heart failure 
and they have no preparation before they die. They, they die suddenly. That's more than half the population. So you might go out, this may be all of our last day, right? And we might go out, you, you, we all know that, but the probability of that happening is so, so small. The probability is you're gonna go to, you know, do your weekly shopping, or you're gonna have it delivered to your home, and, uh, and, you know, but the thing is, you're going to have a normal day today, and it's going to be a good day. And that's the, the majority of our times. But then there's these ideas of, you know, these, it provokes our imagination. Um, I, I know a lot of conspiracy theorists, people that put together all these thought, these, these ideas, and they come up with these imaginative conspiracies that are very provocative and, and make us think, well, maybe it's, maybe that's what's happening. And what makes these theories uh, ride and hold in, uh, dig into our, our consciousness is that they're coherent. They make sense within themselves and they're really possible. Are they probable? I would say no. But one thing like the heaven's gate you mentioned, or there's what I'm very concerned about and all of us should be is that these fears that that fear, this panic that we might even have in the short term, we need to measure that with reality and see, is it, is it possible? Yeah, it's possible, but what's really probable? I'll tell you, it's possible that I'm gonna to die today, but the probability is, is that I'm not. <laughs> and, 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 and not only that, the world, it's possible that the world could go up in nuclear smoke uh, today. It's not probable though, and I'm not gonna live as if, with, with you know, looking over my shoulder to see what's gonna happen. I'm gonna live as if I'm gonna go on to, and live a, a full life. And I think that's the wise thing to do. Now, if I don't have a will, then there's something wrong. If I, don't, I haven't planned for my estate, I think there's something wrong. In other words, I need to be aware that one day I am going to die. And I need to live in terms of my mortality. And I need to live as if, it, as if one day this world's going to end. And it is going to end. In other words, the, whole, the, the, the point of this universe is not for me to extend the life of the universe. That's not what I'm here for. Do I go out and pollute the world then? No, actually, I'm an ecologist. Because I love nature so much, I spend a lot of time in it. I, I invest a lot of my life in, in nature. But um, I'm also very concerned, especially in these days, I think a lot of us are, that people could be manipulated. I got an email this morning from one of my students talking about a brand new religion that she was interested in me investigating to know if it's really true or not. And I appreciate that. It, you know, the point is I'm not an expert on every religion, but I do know how religious people play on our fears. And I want to believe the truth. Ultimately, what is really, when I say truth, I want to believe the reality. I want to live in reality. So what is really real? What is really true? The reality is in my perspective is that the world's coming to an end, but maybe not in the next 10 years, hundred years, thousand years, million years. But it, it's going to come to an end. In light of that, how does it change our way we think about God, way we think about ourselves, way we think about each other? Do we find meaning in life, questions answered in that kind of a, a scenario? And that's what philosophers do. We spend time asking questions about origins, about destiny, about morality, and, and, and to find what is the, what's the key touch points in being human that make give life its fullest meaning. I want to suck the mirror out of life, to quote the poet. You know, I want my life to be really meaningful. And the way I do it is by investigating these very difficult questions and, and defining what's my real anxiety about? How do I address it? And helping people work through that to the place where not just, it's not a psychological problem. I don't have, I'm not, a, I'm not psychotic. I'm not schizophrenic. I'm not weird. It's real. I'm not out of touch with reality. I'm going to be in touch with reality, but that means facing some of these darker fears that we all have as humans and also recognizing what does it mean to be human in this kind of a scene. I'm a homo sapien. I know things and I, I have the ability to think abstractly and to fight with, play with my imagination and my faith, not just my reason and my experience to come to a place of better understanding about how to live my life meaningfully and lovingly in this world. So love is the end in, in result of all, everything I have to say in the end because that's the end result of what I'm living for. I hope, yeah, that's, that's, when I look at the end and I work my way backwards, I realize what makes life really meaningful is this whole context of, of it's a philosophical construct I go through. To, to find meaning in life that gets me away from these cults that are so strange.
the promise survival. Who wants to survive? I don't want to just survive. I want to live. There. <laughs> I could go on for a long. I'm a talker, Laura. I could go on for a long time with this. Oh, you're muted. You're muted. Uh, so, Dr. Jenks, um, we've we've talked a little bit about the different end of the world predictions in your talk. And do you think that climate change or coronavirus are this time the real end time um, signs or should we just chalk these up to these things happen and this is how the cycle of the world goes? Well, you know, I, I pointed out that this year has been an awful year for, you know, apocalyptic signs, you know. Uh, at the same time, you know, of course, there's people, if you go on the internet, I, I just, this past week in particular, I've gone on the internet, there's so many people that want to predict the end. And like I said, they're playing on our fears and I don't think it's legit. So are these signs, they're, they're definitely talking to us about our vulnerability and fra fra fragility, but I don't think it's, it's a biblical sign in the sense of, uh, there's no more in the Bible that talks about a coronavirus specifically or even climate change. But the Bible does, if, if I'm a Bible guy, right? And I, you know, I'm a theist, so I go with that camp. You know, we in this camp believe that the world is going to end, and it's going to end while there's humans alive on this earth, and we don't know when it's going to be. So we look at things like this, and I think it's, we're, we're longing for justice on this earth. We're longing for love to finally be here, and we know it's not here yet, and we know we can't produce it by ourselves just through, just through human effort. So we're wondering, when is this all going to end? When can we go to a world that's, that's loving and just? And I think of you too, you know, how long? Oh, you know, they, they have a, you two is a great band that I love. And they, they talk about how long, how long we need to wait. And there's this, there's this discomfort that I feel in my life that the world's not the place I want it to be. And there's nothing I can do to, do to change it. And I am waiting in one sense. I'm working, but I'm also waiting. I recognize that it's a futile, ultimately a futile effort to try and stop climate change. It's not going to change. Um, the coronavirus, if it's not the coronavirus, it's going to be some other virus. There's always going to be this anticipation of some disaster in our world, and you all know that. It's happened so, you know, I mean, almost every year I get something. And, and at the same time, is that biblical? No. I mean, the Bible talks about wars, rumors of wars, all those kind of images we know about. And it, the Bible says the world's going to end. So live in light of the fact the world is going to end and that we don't know when it's going to be. There are signs, of course, that the world's going to end, but coronavirus and climate change are not the two that we're looking for. All right, so my next question is about us as individuals. Uh, and I know that none of us are getting out of this alive, right? Yeah. So yeah. beyond religion, how do philosophers talk about individual destiny and, and the end of life? Oh, that's a great question. And it, it, it takes more time than we have right now. But I will talk about, philosophers talk about our fears. It's, 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 it sounds psychological. It's, it's universal though. We're all afraid of dying. We're afraid of the possibility of being annihilated. We're afraid of judgment. We're afraid of the, pro the death process. You know, and as you walk into those questions, there's lots of ways that uh, philosophers look. What we do is we compile human data of how people have faced this in the past. So we think of things of immortality. You know, a lot of people believe they need their children uh, provide them into mortality or um, their jobs. They leave a legacy behind. There's a statue or a street named after them, or they got a park bench down Laguna Beach that has their name on it. And that's, you know, they, even they go on, there's some memory. Someone will remember them after they are memories. Or some people, uh, you know, go into chiro, uh, cryogenics. They, they believe that they need to freeze their body and wait for the scientific, you know, uh, advances to, to give them a chance to live forever. There's this idea of immortality that's really interesting. And then there's this view of an an annihilation. So what philosophers do is they explore all these different options and they think about, now, is that tr is it, what's the probability of that being true? And if it is true, even if it's not probable, what does that really mean? What does that say about our own view of ourselves as humans? You know, it always comes back. I love philosophy for that reason. It comes back to human identity, not personal identity. I'm not a, psych a psychologist. I'm a philosopher. Humanity as a whole, what makes us who we are? And how do we perceive ourselves in light of these ideas of death? Death is a great trigger 
the end of life is a great trigger to understand who we are, just like origins. How do we get here? Who are your parents? Origins, you know, if you're adopted, a lot of people are motivated, adopted children are motivated to find their parents because they find their identity in their biology. And we find our identity in our origins, we find our identity also in our end. And uh, those are two points of references to, to live meaningful lives today. So that's what philosophers work on. Well, Dr. James, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us and for giving us uh, some insight and some new things to think about and some old things to think about um, as we progress over the next, uh, our next days. So again, on behalf of Saddleback College and Laura, thank you so much. And students, this does conclude our spring 2020 Dorothy Marie Lowry Distinguished Guest Lecture Series. Thank you so much for participating in this new format. Thank you for joining us in person previously and for participating online. We'll be back next spring 2021, hopefully in person uh, with the new round of Distinguished Guest Lectures. So until then, thank you so much and have a great summer. Mm -hmm.